Uh, hello, everybody, and uh, thanks to David for the invite to speak. Um, I'm slightly intimidated because uh, I haven't got anything to tell you about behavioral health at all. Uh, what I'm going to show you is a set of uh, analytics that we've developed for the hospital environment that we're just beginning the journey to create analogies of what you're about to see for the crisis response and behavioral health. So that's a discount at the get-go. Uh, that What I want you to see when we show you, I'll just spend 10 minutes showing you some of the stuff, is about how an approach like this and a set of techniques like these could apply to your uh, the environment of behavioral health rather than the fact that we've done it. So, so that's, uh, that's, that's an important thing. Also, I'm not a clinician. I spent my 20s studying philosophy um, and uh, the last 20 years I've done a lot of work in government and uh, in health systems, particularly on hospital performance improvement. Uh, my conference joke is that I spent 10 years studying stoicism and ambiguity, which is true, and they've both come in very useful in the management of public health systems. So, um, so we can talk about Hellenistic philosophy later if we get enough alcohol. <laughs> so, um, so I'm going to do about 10 minutes of philosophy and then I'm going to do about 10 or 15 minutes of showing you two examples of the software we developed and then we'll, we'll get out and be done. Okay, thanks. Um, I'm not going to talk about these first three things really at all, but it's important to put them up there and say this is where we're coming from. Already been mentioned in some of the talks and this is that there is a, an ideology, I think, about the quality improvement movement which is fundamental and locked in. So let's take that as an assumption. But I think these second two are worthy of calling out because I think we haven't spent enough time developing information systems for clinical teams in flight. And I think that last 10 yards is a fundamental bit of the game which we struggle with, particularly with frequency and time lag and access to data. And I think that's where, we have, that's where we've been working in recent times. And I couldn't, I couldn't resist, because uh, it, it's Washington. Uh, I first came here in 2010 and with the family in November. We were walking up past the reflective pool just as the sun was setting and the lights were coming up on the Lincoln Memorial. I was in the, in the, I was in the middle of being passionately uh, enraptured by the Doris Kearns Goodwin book, Team of Rivals, which many of you all know. So I was, uh, and, and I had this experience in the Lincoln Memorial. I was reading the Gettysburg Address on the left hand side, and of course, the famous phrase of government of the people. Um, of the people, by the people, for the people was there. But what really struck me was the next six words about the shall not perish from the earth, the fragility of the enterprise to create a nation not based on a tyranny, but on consent. And, and I think, and, and it's through the Gettysburg Address earlier on, uh, can, can a nation so conceived uh, last for long? And, and government at that time, of course, was about physical infrastructure and wars, but these days it's about really personal services and technology and the environment, probably, in, in the, this, this century. And so how do we understand liberty in that context, I think is a really interesting question for us all, because we need to pursue freedom from as well as freedom to in the language of ethics. And, and I think for all of us, um, I'm going to take you on a very brief journey from Lincoln overlapping lives through to the present day. A bit cheesy, but I think it works. You can be the judge. Um, <laughs> this, great, this great poem from Yeats, uh, just leaving behind these, these four words, a centre cannot hold. I think that's where we are with our technology at the moment, and it causes a lot of anxiety, both for our communities, but also our professions. More is being swept away than is being built at the moment, and you can almost feel the fabric tearing, but we're not quite sure what the future is going to look like. But I think we have to encounter this really quite authentically if we're going to build the right kinds of uh, infrastructure, which are probably going to be information infrastructure, right? That's where, that's where the goal is. And, 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 and Deming is a fundamental uh, player in the game, absolutely sure. Interestingly, I had the interesting story about Deming. He, he was a part of the defeat of the Nazis, of course. He ran that course out of Stanford on quality improvement when, when the United States had to mobilize the military machine in historically record time. How, how do we build tanks and planes that will work quickly on the get-go? And that's where, uh, that's where the essence of his philosophy emerged, always given great force. And then afterwards, after the Second World War, there wasn't that much, well, not, not that much call in the United States for quality improvement because absolutely dominated the globe for the next 40 or 50 years. And then, of course, it took Deming to go to Japan and then back again before, I think, uh, the Medal of Honor was awarded and the whole business process re-engineering came, came back to the fore. And then in the healthcare context, again, I'll be, some of you, you know, all, many of you will know about Brent James. I had the privilege to study with Brent for a couple of years, um, on and off, a, a Harkness Fellowship. I lived in California, went to Stanford for a couple of years. Uh, it, uh, investigating high-performing delivery systems here and it was time successive visits to see Brent where the importance of relationships particularly relationships with senior clinical colleagues became fundamental and how all of our change management work has to take place in a way 
to the fullest extent that we can honour the vocational commitment of senior, uh, senior clinicians. Uh, and then, and then uh, software's eating the world, which is uh, a few years old, but it's becoming more true as time goes on. And, and the, the overall context, is in, for me, uh, I spent the last 20 years developing my expertise. I intend to spend the next 10 developing my ignorance. I, I realise I get less and less and less and less, and less as the days goes by, it feels good. Um, but in somewhere around the 1980s, this new public management idea of introducing business disciplines into public services to improve their efficiency. Now, some good things have come out of that, but I also think there's a danger of cultural catastrophe there and this real mismatch between uh, senior clinical professional commitment and executives and policy makers and funders. And, and I think the, uh, the, 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 the way we look at our data, I think, is going to be a fundamental part of reconciling those two positions, which have to be reconciled. We need to have accountability, but we've got to have patient-centred care. So we need to build trust and grow trust in order to realign behaviours. Because we're humans, uh, stories are what we use to develop trust. And if we haven't got our numbers right, we don't know which stories to tell. And so the numbers become, for me, now a fundamental part of the relationships game. And we've got to connect these two things together. Relational data leadership is what I think we need to be thinking about for the future. And because we've got amazing servers now, and we've got amazing statistical power now, and we've got amazing visualisation techniques now, we could begin to imagine what the definitive data models might look like for describing any uh, clinical system for medium to large populations. Uh, maybe. The optimist. Some, some of you will have started healthcare like me, dot matrix printers and monthly reports and no atomic data at all. Um, and, then, and then Excel introduced pivot tables, which was a 10-year party. I was very excited about that. And but we had patient level analysis for the first time and we could really get into it. Uh, and, and then we had, we've had some function-specific automation, but not that much. And now every, everyone's got a dashboard. Click, Tableau, business objects. Any fool with a license in half an hour on YouTube can produce a superficially impressive visualisation. But I'm not sure we're still any closer to the underlying version of the truth about what's going on in clinical systems in a way that will connect the perspective of the team doing the work of the work, the Deming fundamental knowledge, where value is, with the organisations in which those teams must live and in the jurisdictions that must hold, hold the organisations to account. And so I think we have to try and make a generational move in data and, and data management. And, and I think it should be ideologically driven rather than, uh, rather than neutral. Um, and, and my final point on design philosophy um, is about frequency. Uh, I started to think about the general form of the problem for four or five years now and developed a, a really good group of talented people uh, on the engineering and, and clinical engagement side. And we began to realise that frequency and variation were fundamentally important. So, so these three images are just a, a, a standard data set. This is ECG requests for patients who are inpatients in a large tertiary hospital. So the left hand is a 10 months uh, of a timeline and monthly data of how many requests do we get in a clinical measurement department in a large hospital. And when we look at monthly data, and only monthly data, what's interesting is that we control out variation. So the aggregation in time controls out the variation of the data set. The second one along is exactly the same data over exactly the same time period, but looked at on a weekly basis. And then the operational challenge begins to emerge from the data, because will next week be a 27 or an 89 week? And then the final right-hand side data is this exactly the same data with exactly the same time period but sampled on a daily basis. And this is where the operational challenge becomes clear, the variation becomes clear, the, the difficulty of the system becomes clear. And if we have policymakers looking only at monthly data, it can be tempted to say, well, that's stable. It looks okay. Any fool could manage that. How hard could it be? And it's only when we look at the data on the daily or maybe hourly or maybe five minute basis that the true challenge of the people who are struggling with the system, how do we develop fundamental knowledge when we're swinging on the right hand side rather than fundamental knowledge where we're stable on the left? And it's that gap we need to close. And I think it's going to require a reimagining about how we go about things. And uh, all of this can seem impossible. I'm going to talk mostly about hospitals. Um, but again, the analogy I mentioned at the start is what's in play for the talk. But on our side, um, I, think, I think there are things in our favour. Uh, David made a comment about, I think it was David, one of the other speakers said, all, all jurisdictions are different, but under, uh, the phrase I think was, when we, when we cut underneath, there's a lot of similarities. Because of course disease is roughly the same, and homo sapiens sapiens are roughly the same. And, uh, and, and our present state of technology is similar, and our professional consensus is actually quite broad. So I think there's more that unites us than divides us as we try and deliver complex systems, much, much more. 
And so I think we need to be in pursuit of the general form of the problem. And that's why I think the last, this is, I think this was our philosophical meeting of minds, David, is it's not enough to try and get it right here and here and here, but we have to both do that and look at what is then translatable and transferable and teachable and repeatable. And, and, and that, in that way, we have, to, we have to figure out a way to develop decentralized learning networks because we don't know where the next solution is going to come from in the world. And the information system consistency is going to be a fundamental bit of that because at the moment today, even if somebody does solve the problem, they can't say why they solved it and in a way that's going to be applicable necessarily to a different situation. So uh, I realized that all of my, um, all of my touch points are American. Uh, that, that was, that was a <laughs> Uh, that's not just a populist move, it's just happened to be the way it went. Um, I only realised it last night as I was doing the prep. Um, the interesting thing, yeah, yeah, I know. The interesting, the interesting thing about, the, uh, about, about us as humans, though, is that when we don't know, we don't accept that we don't know. We make it up. And we, 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 uh, we make up the lack of data through superstition or myth or bias or prejudice. Um, and the problem is, unless we've got high-frequency patient-level correlates, of, of what's actually going on in the clinical system. We can't test which of our stories is true and which of our stories is false, which are the myths and which are the biases and which are the accurate interpretations of events. And of course, power structures being what they are, the most powerful uh, expressed form of prejudice becomes the truth of the organization. And unless we can challenge that with data, that truth can remain for decades, generations. So, two case studies and then, uh, then I'll finish. Uh, this is what David saw uh, that made him go wow, and it is a bit of a wow when you go in, it's a really big room. We've co-located a lot of our interesting functions, um, and, and we, we built a system, uh, Brett's here from Metro North actually, and, and Metro North is our sort of sister service, up much, much bigger than us, and a little bit further up uh, in Queensland, we're the first to develop, I think, the uh, patient control hubs, um, which... Patch, thank you, yeah, P-A-C-H. And, so, and I visited this a few years ago and thought, yeah, we can do better than that, just teasing. But, uh, but not really, you know what it's like with neighbours. Um, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but but size, size, isn't, size isn't everything. Um, so, so I just want to show you what we did because what it took was very interesting because there's quite a lot of, um, quite a lot of talk about real-time data and various other things. I actually have come to not agree with real-time data. I think we need to get our frequencies right for the reasons I spoke about earlier on to expose variation. And we need to get our time legs down to very, very short periods. The trouble with real-time data is that it overwrites the last image. So we can't see the system behavior. We can't see the variation. We can't see the movement of the system over time. And so, so some hybrid of the real-time and the sample data, I think, is where we need to go. So I'll just, uh, this is what it looks like when you walk in. Uh, I'm going to try and not flood the tech. Oh, there we go, okay, cool. So, so basically, from the left-hand side, we've got the emergency department with two or three logical views, and then we've got our bed state in the hospital, and then as we move over to the right side, we've got the uh, discharge services. So we can, so can visualise uh, where every individual patient is. So here's our first logical image of the emergency department. These are 24 hours on the timeline. And this enables us to calculate what we're expecting in terms of our uh, arriving demand and whether or not the current hour is a busy hour compared to a day of the week like this in a season of the year. Our time breaches ambulance arrivals and total number of patients in the department, which is an interesting thing to track. Some of the work out of Canada has suggested that it might be crowding rather than uh, timeliness, which is affecting our ability to, uh, to deliver care safely. I'm going to let this roll now, actually. So, so if you imagine on the left-hand side, we've got our first logical account of the emergency department that I described for you a moment ago. And then as we move over from left to right, we've tried to expose each of the key uh, business moments so that at a glance we can understand both where our system is now, where it is in relation to its normal behaviour in terms of capacity and demand, and where the critical points of intervention might be if we wanted to improve the situation we find ourselves in. So essentially our slogan here is if it's not actionable, we don't represent it. And so this is patients waiting for a subspecialty team review inside the emergency department. This is an extremely tricky data set to get hold of out of our emergency department systems. And we sample this every five minutes so we can see which teams patients are waiting for, how long they've been waiting, and how many of the cohort are waiting at a point in time. This shows us those patients who are ready, who are likely to be admitted to the hospital, who are currently clinically ready and checklisted, uh, and those that are confirmed admissions. And we're just building views for our wards to see these as well as the departments. 
and emergency departments are the wrong point of analysis. This actually exposes each of the individual treatment areas in the emergency department, and we can click into any one of those and see the patient names, also calculating as we go whether or not those patients have waited longer than they need to be waiting in order to manage flow overall. We've brought together unscheduled demand in terms of what we predict the rest of the demand for the rest of the day to be and those patients that are likely to come in and require beds and, uh, and those predictions get tested in vivo uh, with the teams and we also integrate with our scheduled care demand as well so all the patients who are going in for an operating room uh, visit uh, or a procedure that day so that we can understand what the bed demand is likely to be uh, as the day unfolds. And then as we move further to the right, we can see every bed in our large hospital, uh, two tracks for each side. The grey is a, an empty bed at that point in time. If we hover over any of these bubbles, we get the card and who the attending physician is and the patient's uh, preliminary diagnosis. Uh, and this enables us to connect the patients in the emergency department with the inpatient stock, which is important. And this is an interesting. Again, the x-axis here, this is every ward in terms of how many patients have been admitted and discharged that day. And one of the things that we're now working on the frontier of our work is about the admission process and the behaviour of admitting teams and how that's driving the different parts of, the different parts of our timeliness of response. And then finally, we can see our transfer unit, which is the uh, step-down facility inside the hospital for patients who are almost certainly going to go home, uh, but, but who, uh, who, haven't, who haven't yet moved. So the interesting thing for us um, at, at this stage of our evolution is that we're now in a position where the curation, if you like, of all of the various data sets has enabled us to bring together a much more powerful storytelling mechanism and action guidance. Um, and, and then I'll just spend five minutes now showing you where we've taken this to next, which is the ability to take the things off, off the screen and put them onto the desktop um, in, in hitherto unanticipated ways. Um, so I'll just, I'm, I'm hoping this will work. This is my last tech. Uh, fingers crossed moment, you, you'll all know this particular terror I'm feeling. Here we are. So, so we, we, uh, all those things you've seen so far have been built in Click. Our state board, a click, our state board a click licensed Queensland about four years ago, and so we built in Click for that. But it was insufficiently powerful for us to do what we wanted to do. And so we created uh, what I'm showing you here, which is just new, newly in production in the last uh, few months. Um, uh, site, site, our, our Gold Coast in Queensland and also a second major uh, facility in, in another state as well. But basically we're interested in taking all of that information and put it on the desktop and again thinking of the analogy, here's the major areas of, uh, of risk inside a hospital and there's some things that we've started to be able to see for some time but thinking about that next generation of software what we experienced in terms of requests was clinical directors not only being uh, sort of interested in waiting lists and backlogs and schedules, but also curious about how the service was working at a sufficiently disaggregated level in order to be able to have meaningful conversations with colleagues about recent data. Because as we all know, if you show someone quarterly data and they can't, then it's like, so what? I can't see myself. E even monthly data can, can have that effect, as we, as we saw earlier on in terms of uh, uh, controlling out variation. So here's six months worth of new and follow-up appointments in a clinic gynecology, in this case uh, anonymized. And what we, what we can now do is click into last week and we actually harvest this data every day, it runs overnight. And I can see every clinic that ran in the gynecology service last week, which is interesting in itself, but it becomes much more interesting and much more powerful when I can see each individual doctor and see the clinics that each individual doctor ran. So if this is Dr. Jones, um, we can see last week they saw 10 new and uh, five review appointments. but. If I've only got that level of data, and this is much worse if it's only at team level or only quarterly, then it's very difficult to have an actionable conversation. But if I can then click Dr. Jones's name and say, your clinic, do, do you do all day Thursday in clinic? I've immediately validated my data. Because if it comes up wrong against Dr. Jones's name, we've got to go back and sort the mapping out. We've got to sort the mapping out, that's the next job for us. But if, if we do, uh, if we do uh, have agreement that yes, Thursday morning is the, uh, is the, is the, the thir all day Thursdays in clinic, we can then say, well, is it interesting that on Thursday morning last week, we only saw one new patient and 10 review patients? And now we can look at the 
that Thursday morning clinic from Dr. Jones and say, how did that clinic perform over the last six months? Now we've got a different conversation. And at the moment, a lot of our evidence is the published scientific literature, which as we all know, takes 18 months to publish the damn thing, by which time the whole system's moved on. What we need is last week's data for, Mrs. for, for Dr. Jones, so we can talk to her about how that clinic, because it's not all about physician behavior, right? It's about scheduling systems and everything else. And then the final thing we wanted to do was identify right the way at the disaggregated level, the bit of the system we're interested in, in this case maybe new appointments, and we created this activation button so that we know that with combinatorial maths it's easy to create 150 million charts because all you do is put a set of filters on and it sounds superficially impressive. But those of us interested in quality improvement might only be interested in four. So how do I take the four charts I need out of 150 million and make them, make them immediately available to me? So I click the activation button and I get superpowers. And in this case, I might sit down with Dr. Jones and say, how, what do we think is reasonable for this outpatient clinic? Now, say we agree five, we can then put five in. And I can also then set an automated alert system to say, just email me. I can do it. I don't want to do it daily because it's an outpatient clinic. Email me each week if we don't actually achieve five news, myself and Dr. Jones. And then, and then that activation can be set by as many different people, uh, as many different times for each user who logs on. So what we're trying to do is, um, Amazon is our model here. Amazon's very interesting. Whatever we think about its pay rates and its human rights and its impact on local retail, uh, I'm, just, <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just selecting certain interesting things, not, not the whole game. Um, we could talk about mission more, but I, 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 I would have to digress. Amazon's interesting for its software because what it, what it combines is a, a ruthless standardization of the characteristics of every item in their catalog with a radical personalization of the use of everyone who logs on so it remembers you and it brings you to you each time you log on. And so we were interested in seeing whether uh, combining these two things would in, in improve an environment for clinical engagement. And so you'll, you've seen I've activated that chart. I'll show you one other thing um, which I think is cool. P people who, who run surgical procedures uh, struggle with capacity and demand oftentimes. We can have 80 surgeons. Which one of them have likely got too many cases on their books? It's an interesting question, very simple question. I know your Veterans Administration periodically stumbles with this kind of thing as well. We certainly do in publicly funded services. So, so it, wouldn't it be nice if we could click into each team with patients listed for surgery? Uh, and see which of our surgeon colleagues are likely to have too many patients on their lists at the moment given their own personal utilization profile. And so we created what we call the nominal waitlist maximum. And this is a personal trend now for Dr. Smith here. And this is the last year of patients on the waiting list. This is the calculation we, we've done personalized to Dr. Smith based on their historic throughputs. And again, surgeons being uh, scientists, or all of them one form or another, we want to expose their personal data. So again, we can constantly validate on a daily basis, is this you? And if it's you, have we got a problem? And if we've got a problem, how big a problem is it? And if we want to solve the problem, which patients does this problem refer to? So down here, I can click into every surgeon's waiting list by urgency and by capacity and demand risk every day and literally see the details of the patients who are on that list, export those to Excel, rebook them with other patients or, or whatever else I might want to do. And then the final, uh, the final two very brief cool things I'll show you. The first is about how we can affect decisions, resource allocation decisions in real time. We often have relatively junior staff actually pushing the button on resource allocations, and they often tend to be fairly poorly supported by information systems. So this is an operating room schedule looked out for the next three or four weeks, which has been data we've always struggled to get. We, we integrate with these and poll the systems every hour. And we can click into next week and see the actual sessions that are up. And what's interesting now, because we've automatically curated all of the patients on the waiting list for each surgeon, I can click into any one of the individual sessions and we can begin to do some cool stuff by saying, here's all the patients who are booked in this session a week on Thursday. But we also run a personalized algorithm for each surgeon on how long the procedure that the patient's listed for is likely to take them based on their own personal practice. And so we, we got a, we've got a running commentary of how many minutes are available in the OR. And because we have that, we can then list all of the patients who are still on the waiting list and apply a three-stage algorithm, which is how urgent are the patients, um, how close to their maximum breach time are they, and how many minutes are they likely to need in the OR, such that we can say all other things being equal, book this patient next. So again, I, I'm not able to show you the behavioral health version, but once we've got the 
large-scale data sets at the right frequencies integrated with both the capacity systems and the demand systems, capable of exposing patient identifiable information with a, with a balanced logic in play. We can not only make better decisions, but we can also uh, begin to understand how different systems are functioning. And then I'll, I'll stop now. The last thing to show you, you see the top, these, this is why we couldn't do things in click. Uh, because we didn't have the power. This is a Netflix shelf now, um, and so you've, here's the chart that I interacted with there. I, c I can call that up. The next time I log on, this will be available to me. So ju just the four or five charts that I'm interested in, I can, um, I, I can automatically have taken into my own environment, and then I can grab any one of those charts and put them into uh, my project screen, which will then have just the highly atomized and disaggregated data for, say, my quality improvement project but then automated up to yesterday, and then we have single click export to PowerPoint as well, which I've spent many late nights cutting and pasting out of Excel, and I thought, wouldn't it be good if I could just get the charts I wanted and create a PowerPoint slide so I could send it to my colleagues um, and, and, and not have to worry too much about that. So, in summary, um, if the last 30 minutes has been interesting to you, that's good. If it's been interesting but irrelevant, that's David's fault. <laughs> um, and if it's, if it's both interesting and relevant, then, then, we, can, well, then we can both claim, claim a little bit of the credit. And I, and I just want to finish again. I, I was a literature grad before I did philosophy and then ended up in software, for God's sake. I don't know how that happened, but time flies. Um, it's about always remembering the point. Uh, I think it was Drucker who had that great phrase about, the, well, two great phrases. One is the trouble with targets is that managers hit them, uh, even if in so doing they destroy the organization. And, and the other great one was uh, it's, it's must always be constantly on our guard against hitting the target but missing the point. And, and, I, and, and this, is, uh, this is from Elliot, um, Choruses in the Rock. He was talking about communism at the time. We're talking about people trying to escape the darkness outside and within by dreaming of systems so perfect that nobody will need to be good. As we move into a world of artificial intelligence and automation, and, and I think we're part of the research groups that are doing the prologue for what that needs to look like, particularly in public healthcare systems, I think as lo we must remember that for now at least the subordination to the professional vocationalism is a fundamental part of the game because that's where we can meet and I think collaborate with technology and the professions to deliver the best for populations given our scarce resources. Wow. I hope we're okay. Thank you.